Okay, uh, it's good morning here in the United States. Obviously, good afternoon in Europe and good night in India. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have the honor to chair this panel on reshaping politics between populism and solidarity. We have a very distinguished group of panelists. Uh, I don't need to introduce uh, uh, all of them. We'll go in the order Nadia Urbinati political scientist at Columbia University, who has been working on populism for many years. Uh, Craig Calhoun, a, a distinguished professor at uh, Arizona State University in Tempe, has been president of every possible institution, Social Science Research Council, uh, London School of Economics, Peregrine Institute, Avisai Margali, a prominent uh, retired philosopher uh, uh, from Israel for many years at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, and uh, last but not least, Seila Ben Habib, a very well-known uh, distinguished uh, professor of philosophy, political theorist, feminist scholar, uh, cosmopolitan thinker, uh, uh, professor at Yale University. So without further ado, each of the panelists will have 10 minutes for brief introductory presentations then I will try to provoke some conversation among them, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So Nadia, you go first, please. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here. And um, so let's see um, what, whether I can uh, put uh, in few words what I really would like to strongly to talk about with all of you. Um, the question of populism, well, we don't want to go through a definition here because it's, a, there is, it's no time and place to do so, but at least one important element should be emphasized in order to talk about it in this situation, Nam namely that uh, at least we should agree, and I think this is important, that populism is a phenomenon internal to democracy and it can stretch the democratic constitution to its limits, and during this pandemic, we saw those limits stretched in several cases. One is the most important and uh, radical one. It's the Hungarian one. Uh, Orban really stretched the constitution to the limits and made the parliament uh, uh, vote on its own suspension, which is something incredible in a democratic uh, constitution or uh, democracy. So it's possible in this case that populism goes truly beyond its limits. So having said so, a problem that emerged that interests me in the last uh, three months or so is the following. This has been interesting. Perhaps the pandemic, uh, I'm uh, rephrasing from uh, what I read here and there, perhaps the pandemic had or will have potentially, potentially undermine the primacy of politics and partisanship and put the primacy on science, on knowledge, competent knowledge, and this would be a good news for populism because this is a way of uh, making populism somehow subjected to these scientific uh, uh, new competence. Um, and thus, there is a good, in this sense, the future cannot be necessarily bad for this reason, because, um, because we saw an emergency of uh, competence about politics. I think this is wrong, or I don't, I don't think it is, it is convincing. By the way, this was also one of the main uh, topic of the debates between uh, Rosanne Ballon and, Sa and Chantal Mouffe uh, on Chantal Mouffe on, uh, on Le Monde uh, recently. I think that in fact, for two reasons cannot be convincing. First of all, because what we call science and uh, we saw science in action, well, it's not a kind of uh, uh, beyond disputation science. In fact, there were medical, biological, scientific disciplines using algorithms sometimes, statistics some other times, and in the process of uh, uh, searching for a scientific knowledge of this virus. So they shared, many scientists, biologists, uh, epidemiologists, virologists, they shared with ordinary citizens their ignorance. 
and they sometimes uh, show even contradictory uh, positions. So in some sense, uh, uh, the populists, as many they said, as we interviewed so Salvini said, well, you know, the scientists are not more competent than you and me, so this cannot be a good news in for, um, for the disappearance of populism because they made their own friend scientists versus unfriendly scientists. The, we saw scientists divided between those who were in favor of keeping uh, less open and those who were in favor of closing everything. So in this sense, it's not a good news. Second, it's not a good news for a reason that has to do, in my view, with politics in, in this sense, or political de or democracy in this sense. There was an attempt uh, or a tendency within democratic theory uh, to consider, and I mentioned some names, Philip Petty, you can sometimes also the, the uh, some, what, some, something that Rosan Ballon wrote, but other scholars, the uh, epistem epistemologists, so-called epistemic democrats, the idea that the, uh, the, uh, the way of saving democracy from itself or does uh, from the risk of becoming so divisive, so partisan oriented, is to narrow the space and the domain of political uh, contestations and open and enlarge the domain of uh, impartial bodies of deliberation, autonomous bodies of deliberation, like, uh, like committees for decision making or suggestion for decision making, so as to take away from politics much of his myth, so-called, and to give it to competence. I think that the risk in this case is a very, um, un for me, an unappetible risk, because it is a way of debilitating democracy in the attempt to debilitating, to debilitate populism. And I think we don't want to do that. So in my view, does, this is not the science, the science trajectory cannot be a good um, way to be uh, uh, pursued in order to find an alternative uh, to populism. And I want to conclude in this way uh, by, uh, by adding that if I have time, I, will, uh, I can uh, come. In fact, this pandemia um, made political or democratic societies uh, uh in uh, uh, react i mean in made them in um, somehow in a risky situation but with a great opportunity meaning from now on many of our society will face great decline of employment and uh, increased poverty and so on and so forth now here is the problem in this situation, if uh, uh, democracy is not capable of developing forms of social justice discourse and the organization parties in some sense and projects, then populism will have a prater in front of itself. In some sense, the argument made by, by Habermas a few years ago that the, the success of populism is the recognition of a decline of social democracy. I agree, I think is totally right. And in this situation, this these, uh, challenge, this risk can be uh, truly uh, verifiable and feasible because we, we, we will have millions of people in, uh, in a quest for intervention and it's not enough to give them some money in, in cash it is important that democratic states have a project concerning public services and an organization of the job market that is not simply the neo-libertarian uh, market of taking a job no matter what. Uh, so it is a very demanding moment and for this reason, both on the science domain and of the social issue domain, populists can be there uh, waiting for great uh, uh, growth instead of decline. I don't want to be so much pessimist, but this is the, the ball I like to roll now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Craig, you are next. Okay, thanks, Jose. Um, and thanks to uh, 
of Volko, Giancarlo, and all of the organizers uh, for this. Um, let me just make a few points about this. First, uh, populism is not essentially anti-democratic. It gets treated this way partly because it is dangerous to actually exist in democracies in our current context and others. Um, conspiracy theories, demagogues, and so forth uh, create some of this danger. And populism is typically corrosive of institutions. So the paradox here is democracy depends on the institutions against which populism is corrosive. But populism is actually often an expression of democratic demands against those institutions, um, however um, problematically guided. What populism is crucially against, in many cases, is not democracy, but republican frameworks um, for constitutional democracy. It's really republicanism that is the uh, perceived as the threat, um, whether articulately or not. Um, that is, republicanism imposes limits on democracy, rules and norms, even the rule of law, um, that Democrats can, um, can experience, populist Democrats can experience as limiting them. Um, they resent these rules and norms as well as the elites. Um, and we need to recognize how much republicanism entrusts elites with leadership. And therefore, uh, there can be the populist grievances with elites who sometimes deserve it and sometimes don't. And we can be cursed with bad elites. And so in analyzing populism, we often look at the populists, um, if you will, at the followers, at the so-called grassroots, um, or we look at the very peculiar extremes of international conspiracy theories, but we fail to look at the um, elites themselves. So in relationship to what Nadia just said, social democracy declined in considerable part because elites failed in their trust to care for the societies um, they were leading. Um, elites of the last decades allowed neoliberalism to dominate globalization and even globalism. So we face a very interconnected world. We need to think globally, as Jose was saying in the previous session, but this has been um, made problematic by the extent to which the dominant elites in almost every country um, accepted a broadly neoliberal frame um, and uh, um, accepted um, approaches to uh, globalization, which failed to make it um, fairer and uh, um, uh, more readily um, embraceable by all populations, and failed to provide care for those um, who had a difficult transition in it. Um, so this is an argument I've made in Reset and all before, but the problems with actually existing as opposed to elite or idealistic cosmopolitanism. Um, there have been major social transformations promoted by these elites and others, and they work better for them than for many others. So elites, often liberal elites, have not been in favor of inequality or in favor of deindustrialization or in favor of all of the you know, corporate power guiding globalization. But they have tolerated these partly because and visibly because they have worked okay for them. Their housing values have gone up. Well, they didn't say they were against um, a public housing arrangement. They didn't say they were in favor of homelessness, but they were quite happy to see the housing values go up and so forth. There has been radically intensified domestic inequality in all of the countries that were social democratic, some more than others. Um, and the elites have often embraced meritocratic illusions that legitimate their places. Well, they succeeded in exams. They went to the best schools. Um, they performed well. So meritocracy has become overwhelmingly um, a legitimation for inequality. Um, the elites also often embraced cultural and formal inclusion without material transformation of the social and economic underpinnings. So it's not that the cultural inclusion is in any sense bad, 
but that there is a real tension introduced by promoting it um, in tandem with meritocracy and without um, egalitarian or solidaristic social transformations. Therefore, it becomes crucial when we think of the French revolutionary triad of liberty, equality, fraternity, we need to embrace fraternity. Solidarity, we can say in less sexist terms, solidarity has to mean not just a sentiment, but material integration, actually accomplishing the integration. What we see in many societies, in the US, in Britain, um, indeed in Brazil, in other places, is the weakness of the sense of being one country and in some sense in it together, whether in relation to the pandemic or other issues. Um, we see metropolitan cities connected to each other internationally more than to their national hinterlands. Um, so this demands a renewal um, of the nation, um, not just an acceptance or appreciation of old national identities institutions, but an effort to um, rebuild and transform. So renewing public service, renewing the institutional and other bases for integrating countries across regions, across classes, um, across ethnicities and races. Um, and therefore, it does involve attempting to achieve national solidarity. Um, this need not be anti-global. Um, promoting international conflict has often been a tactic in domestic politics by populists, <coughs> by demagogues. But in fact, the national is integral to the transnational. There is no transnational without the national. Now we can imagine other forms of global order that are not based on nations, but we need to recognize how much strengthening transnational institutions today requires nations to behave differently, not abandoning nations. So I agree with Sheila, we must work through the national democracies, but we must also work to transform the national democracies, not just at the level of formal politics, but sociologically and economically, as part of the cause of making nations more productive. This is necessary, um, not least because of the fact that national governments and very specifically transnational agreements are often the only um, capacity that exists to limit corporate-driven, finance-driven global capitalism. Um, the, um, there is not <clears throat> a ready mass democratic um, way of doing this. And um, if we separate too strongly the value spheres of politics, economics, and society, we come up with impotent political solutions in relation to what has become quite drastic economic power. Um, and we can think about the issue of surveillance capitalism that came up in the last session with Shayla and I wrote to everyone in chat. I agree completely with Shayla's concerns about privacy and trying to protect um, what amount to the Republican conditions for democracy um, and for good citizenship. But I also think we have to face how radically we have let surveillance capitalism come to dominate. That's it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Craig. And all of you are within time, self-discipline. Uh, next is Avisai Margali. Please, Avisai. Well I, well, I would like to actually address what Craig just raised, namely populism and solidarity in its current form. Populism has history, a, a checkered history, but I would like to talk about populism in its current form. One thing is common to populists from Modi in India, and Urban in Hungary, and Erdogan in, in Turkey, and Netanyahu in Israel, and Brexit, Johnson, and Trump, of course. Namely, the claim of the populist, we are the people, speaking in the name of the people and trying to exclude others who are citizens, namely to narrow down the idea of citizens, be they the Muslims 
in India, the Kurds in Turkey, the Palestinians and the Arab Israelis in Israel, and I can go on and, they, and it's clear where it is heading. Namely, what the current populists are doing is undermining exactly the sense of fraternité in the French revolutionary triangle. Namely, narrowing down citizenship, the real full-fledged citizenship, to confine it to the ethnic dominant or to the dominant group in each country. So the populists speak in the name of the people and the question who is, who is, who is not in, among the people, who is not included. And, undermine, and by undermining the idea of citizenship, making the others, the immigrants, the foreigners, as at best tolerated, and actually, if we can get rid of them, it's even better. This, I think, is undermining this kind of solidarity that needed for citizenship. And I think that in that sense, this is what undermines democracy. The elite here, the populist element, the anti-elite element, comes that with a conspiracy theory. The elite tries to recruit those outsiders in its fold against their true people, the genuine, the nativist, the ethnic group, we the people. And the elite with those foreigners are conspiring. And it's not necessarily new. I mean, even, I mean, if you take urban in, in Hungary, this, the campaign against Soros, basically as a ruthless cosmopolitan, which used to be the euphemistic term for the campaign against Jews in the Zhdanov era in Russia. So the idea is basically to exclude and from the realm, from the public sphere, the outsiders. And the question, who are the outsiders? This struggle started already in the revolt and the counter-revolution in France. It was very, it was manifested in the Dreyfus affair and in the Vichy, namely, as Maurras said, that Jews, Huguenots, Freemasons, and foreigners are anti-French, anti-France. And the, and the populist, I think, are exactly on this line. Namely, the people, the true people, the authentic, the genuine, maybe the inarticulate, those, they are under attack. The way of life is under attack, but foreign elements that don't really belong. And, uh, and then you form, and then you put the others with sort of severe test of loyalties. You remember perhaps what used to be in England, the cricket test of Norman Tabbitt. He noticed, or he pointed out, that in a cricket game, cricket matches between India, say, and England, or the Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, and, you know, the West Indies, the people that even if they were born already in the United Kingdom, the people who came from those countries side with a, so to speak, country of origin and not with England. And therefore they are not truly, they don't truly belong. So the whole idea, the populist streak is basically to exclude and create uh, the people, and na uh, the nativist streak basically, I think, is very pronounced and very important here 
and it undermines simultaneously the solidarity needed for citizenship and democracy with it. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Abisai. Now we have two fantastic kind of the two sides of, of populism and democracy. And Sheila, is you, now you have the floor. Okay. Um, um, I'm very happy to be speaking after <laughs> Abishai because uh, he said so many things that I, I agree with. And I think we're going to have maybe a nice um, conversation here on the panel because I am, like Abishai, extremely skeptical about the promise of uh, populism. While I accept that populism uh, the populist elements have been historically part of both left and right wing moments. But um, Craig said something very interesting when he talked about populism basically being against institutionalization and addressing fundamentally the role of the Republican, you know, of Republican institutions and also the Republican Republican elites. Uh, but there is um, uh, something in the heart of populism, whether you look at left-wing movements in Latin America or the European variants, and I want to talk a little bit about Turkey to illustrate this. I think the, the contradiction in the heart of populism is the mobilization of the people against the elites who then get betrayed for another series of elites. In other words, uh, there is something about um, uh, uh, transcending the language of class in populism and yet ending up with results that are extremely class bound and that don't force the structure. So um, I want to uh, just take the case of Erdogan as an example uh, here, but um, I think it can be generalized. Uh, populism is a, a moment of disarticulation of democratic republican institutions. It is based upon an identification of the majority of the people, supposedly the boundaries are never quite defined, with leader or leadership. It's a moment of vertical integration, okay, which appeals to a horizontal signifier, but it's vertically integrated. And as Abishai pointed out, in this moment of identification with the leader, there is always a demarcation between those who authentically belong to the people and those who don't. So I think there is a romance about uh, uh, the concept of the people that is used in some democratic theory, but maybe we should talk about here uh, the people, citizens, non-citizens, stakeholders, and I mean, uh, we, we should try to clarify this term because um, uh, the danger of policing the boundaries of who belongs and who does not belong to the people is something that accompanies uh, populist movements. And I will make this claim about the Gilets jaunes in France as well right now. And forgive me, you know, Chantal Mouffe's theory was mentioned. I think that very often she just simply skirts this question and does not even take up the issue of the boundaries of the demos, uh, meaning immigrants and others. Now, the contradiction that I see in the heart of populism, um, I want to illustrate with the case of Erdogan, okay? Erdogan, um, in uh, the initial years uh, of when the AK party came to power, spoke in the name of a different concept of the people than the exclusionary Kemalist Turkish nation. It was going to be a more inclusive concept of the people with the Kurds, the Armenians, the Alawites, a kind of Islamic internationalism that Erdogan was getting at. At the socioeconomic level, Erdogan did a couple of things. He institutionalized basically national health care. 
and uh, this is enormously significant. He also put in some social economic measures for women uh, who are, you know, housewives and mothers, enabling them to stay basically at home, right? It's this populist uh, uh, policy of, of de demographic policy, stay at home and have more children for the nation. But as we have seen, the real economic agenda of Erdogan is to support the building sector in the country, the building sector, which has deep transnational ties, the spread of telecommunications, the spread of you know, uh, cell phones, etc., the internet, which he can now control, okay? So the, the populist ideology has gone along with a, a globalizing economic agenda that has in fact served a kleptocratic elite that is very much part of his family. I think you, one has to understand the political economy of familialism that seems to me to be very much a part of populism, whether it is Trump and his family, whether it is you know, Orban and his cohorts, whether it is Erdogan, or whether it was the Argentinian model of Peron. Okay? Uh, we, we need to understand why populist, populism permits this kind of political economic familialism. So in that sense, uh, forgive me, but I am very skeptical about the democratic promise of populist movements. If we are talking about something more like a kind of, and sometimes I think, Nadia, this is what you have in mind, a kind of Gramscian mobilization of large sectors of the population in the name of big, in the name of shared ideals, then why don't we just talk about that? Rather than, you know, using and misusing a term which began as, you know, uh, we know with the concept of the Narod, the Narodnik in the Russian Revolution. It was anti-Semitic, it was agrarian, it was anti-modernist, it was anti-elitist. I mean, the history of the movement contains some of these elements which keep, which keep coming up. So the contradictions of populism is what I'd like us to talk about a little bit in the panel. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Now, obviously, we have enough um, grounds for debate among the four pa panelists first. I want to give the ones that came first, Nadia and Craig, the chance to respond to basically the other presentations and then uh, to see whether anybody else wants to say something before we open the floor for discussion. So Nadia, Craig, would you like to? Well, let me be clear. I don't want to, um, well, I, I, wrote, I was working on this topic since the last, last years. No, I don't think that populism is a, a promise of democracy. Populism develops from inside of uh, an idea of voluntary organization of the people, or voluntary participation of the people. And in this sense, you cannot say that is outside of democracy. It is a way of deforming democracy or making it risky and transforming into a risky game, even more than it is naturally. So this is clear. Second, the people. There is, a, of course, a, you know, an encyclopedia long uh, trajectory of what the people means here. But if we agree that uh, the constitutional conception of the Euro, uh, the fictio Yuri, the people that is in the constitution, is not the people that populism refers to. It is the people as a, uh, a representation of us against them, as Abishai said, and the them this depends from the country in which it develops. In some countries, the them can be the uh, immigrants. In other countries, they can be, you know, the socialists or, or the liberals, I don't know. So the them is crucial. It, it is a representation of a people by exclusion. 
does it is a kind of uh, selecting from the people the two people and there is one though one category that is crucial in my view at least to understand the uh, populist wherever you are the, regardless of the context the attack on the establishment uh, in uh, in order to make themselves be anti-establishment and this and this game is the game of politics of, of populism because once they are in power if they go in power they have to prove every day that they are not like the establishment so they are permanently campaigned like we see everywhere so it is an important game this one now is this a way of saying that they are against the elite of course they say so but they are not it is a way of circulation of the elite it is the formation of a new elite in a quick way to create a new so all this dirty game of politics the only thing i would like to ask to to craig i like your presentation is the following in what sense you say anti-republicanism because i do understand that republicans from 18th century on it means the rule of law the constitution division of power but the language of populism is inside of the roman tradition the populus versus the senate is truly a a, a kind of uh, a prior to our language in some sense it is perhaps a critical against the republicanism as a constitutional theory of politics but not against republicanism as the dualism between the few and the many the plebs and the senate which is a kind of uh, you know uh, food for populism in some sense so this is would be my question to to uh, to, uh, to you thank you so great thanks let me begin with your question nadia just to say i agree completely um and I want to elaborate. First, I agree that populism is ancient. It didn't start with Narodniki. Um, and it's a um, mistake to fail to embed it within a longer history, even before the Romans. It's the worry. I mean, in a sense, Plato thought all democracy was populism. And therefore, it had to be hemmed in by a variety of institutions. You know, Aristotle comes up with a proto-Republican theory, Rome perfects it, and Nadia's account in that sense is, I think, right. Um, and so a voice of the people, a limited voice of the people um, uh, is there. Um, and the risk of the tribunes, the people being bad demagogues is there already in Rome. Um, we could see Savonarola um, in Renaissance Florence as a classic populist. There is no more perfect image of the populist than Savonarola. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Nadia. Your microphone is muted. Well, um, so anyway, I think um, throughout the history of republicanism, there is this um, tension of how much, if any, can popular voices and um, the idea of we the people be admitted? And in the modern era, with the US revolution forward and so forth, the, um, some very Republican thinkers decide they can have more democracy, more voice of the people, but they have to limit it. So they have the Senate, not just the Congress. They have a variety of institutions uh, to limit it. And when I said anti-Republican, I don't mean that many populists are reading political theory textbooks and debating um, with uh, John Pocock, I mean that they are hostile to the limits that have been put in place to try to preserve the Republic. Now, I'm not trying to argue Chantal Mouffe's case. Um, I do think that populism sometimes has been progressive, but that one can by no means count on that, partly because populism is not itself an ideology. Uh, Nadia calls it a game, that's not bad. Um, that is, it's a mode of mobilization, which can be taken up by leaders with different views. Um, it can be captured and manipulated by different elites. The, the leaders of populist movements are not the non-elite um, lowest level of the um, society or something. And those leaders may attach it to an ideology, left or right or other, or they may be more venial and familiarist, as Shayla suggests. The opportunity is created for the capture of populism for self-interest, not just for ideology. So there are contradictions of populism, to be sure, I agree, good phrase, 
And the contradictions center on who are the people, as Abishai says, the, the potential not only for the exclusion of outsiders like immigrants, but for imposition of conformity of a standard model of what it means to be the people, the one right way to be a member of this nation. So that's a, a key contradiction. But there are contradictions of liberalism too, in this sense, including the contradiction between economic and political liberalism and uh, um, the um, individual as property owner, um, uh, you know, understood ideologically so that corporations even become individuals or mere creations of contract. contract. Um, and, and the more you know, political rights-bearing individual. Um, the moment of uh, disintegration of Republican institutions, as Shailo just put it, follows from and is inextricably tied to previous disintegration. Populists don't start the disintegration. Populists arise in the context of both limits on popular participation and the disintegration um, of the society in various ways. And that disintegration, if I were dating this from most of the modern West, certainly the US, I would say has a 1970s tipping point. Um, in which there is an increasing pulling apart, not just an inequality, but other kinds of pulling apart. And the populist game in Nadia's sense arises in that context, but cannot be understood as though populism were simply an ideology bringing its populist views out of nowhere to this. It's a reaction. It's embedded in uh, relation to what's gone before historically. Um, finally, more populism may not be the solution. In saying that populism um, expresses democratic uh, uh, frustrations and populism um, calls our attention to various issues of social solidarity, that doesn't mean populism offers a solution. This is the sense in which I'm not arguing Chantal Mouffe's case. Um, the solution may be better republicanism, but we have to look at the sense in which people have failed to uphold the stronger, more robust republicanism and failed to build the social solidarity, which would be the support for a more cohesive social participation in that. Uh, if I'm I allowed to- just add one thing. May I just say one thing? That, say that, uh, please. Yeah, and very ahead. briefly. I, uh, you know, by going to the 19th century and the Narodniki, I was talking about a modernist movement and modern movement. The uh, term populism, of course, if we want to go back to the history of political thought, uh, all this would be a different you know, conversation. And as you know, uh, the term democracy was very often identified with mob rule. And what even Aristotle defines is constitutional republican uh, form uh, of some kind of you know, government. I, I agree with that. But I think that we have to be careful about the um, sanctification or the romanticization associated with the term the people. I want to know who the people are going to be other than the constitutional referent of the demos. And we can't just do as if these are all well interchangeable and so on. No, they're not. No, they're not. The constitutionally demarcated people has its own problems, but the evocation of uh, the people, as we know, you know, from Carl Schmitt onwards, is never an innocent gesture. Okay, but I want I I agree that there are progressive aspects moments to populist mobilization. And I wasn't just setting out the contradictions of populism, Craig, the where there are contradictions in every political theory that we can think of. But I want, I was just posing a challenge to, the cha uh, to our panel. What is the political economy moment in populism that enables mobilization of the people, but then at the end, ends up sacrificing the people to the established capitalist order, okay? And this is the, also the interpenetration, as we know, of the national and the global from Saskia's work. 
the national elites are not opposed to global elites. The national elites are those who bring in the global industries, telecommunications, building the internet, etc. So I was just asking us to be a bit, uh, you know, more specific about this current moment in uh, in populism. May I join in? Yes, please, Abisai, please. Well, one thing is the obsession of the leaders in populist movements with the media. And I think the media is actually part of, an essential part of the story. When Berlusconi was in power, and in a way he was one of the first of this wave, he owned three television channels. He was the owner. Erdogan and Netanyahu and Urban and Modi, they want to get hold of the media. They don't own it, but through legislation, through the power, they want to own the media. And the idea is that the media is a substitute by a soft power or relatively soft power then a coup d'etat or a putsch. You can basically control a great deal of the public life by controlling the media. And the obsession with the media is very much there. There is also a streak of populism, which is, I find interesting, is that, the, that many of those leaders Salvini and others, they are buffoons. They think that they have good time to the people, to their, in the gatherings, in the, the buffoonery is interesting. I mean, the whole thing of cool jokes on the expense of the others. Now, about the exclusion, which was my main point. The main thing about, I mean, obviously waves of immigration are used as a trigger for populist movements. But uh, if you look at what, what they capitalize on is the immigrants who are already in those states, not the newcomers, but it's turned mostly against the Hispanic in America, who are already in the in United States, who are already there. So it's not just by trying to raise the issue of immigration, you turn against those segments of those citizens in your country that you find as an alien force, potential betrayers. And I think that the point is and I think is we try too much to say what's wrong with us that bring about populism. As if the first thing is soul searching what went wrong with us people. And then try to, to do sort of a certain kind of gesture, intellectual gesture, a Narodnik gesture, Up, after all, the Narodnik movement in Russia was an elitist, an elitism, and a, a very pronounced form of elitism. What I'm saying is, first see what's wrong with populism and concentrate on that. Then we shall see what's wrong with us. And the order of things politically, I think is crucial here. Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, there is never enough time. I suggest that we gather the questions that you, Sophia, basically go and read all the questions, give us 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll give two minutes for each of the panelists to have the last word. Okay, we have a bit of a hybrid as usual. Some people have written their questions down and some have, um, would like to speak them out loud. So, if you like to speak, please be very brief. Yes. So, the first question was written and it's 
how do you, the panel, define solidarity? Politics are using the term in the context of, of crises like the 2008 financial crisis or today with COVID, but less with the crisis of populism. It seems too vague. This is from Rui Marquez in Germany. Um, and then we have another written question. I can put those together and then maybe we can do the spoken right. ones afterwards. Okay. Yes, please. So uh, this is from Angela, who's one of our students. It's, Could you please comment more on the idea of Kasmute, that the populist voters support democracy but don't always want to be bothered by politics? That actually what they're looking for on populist voters are a leader that knows the people and make their wishes come true, favoring a deliberative or plebiscitary democracy rather than participatory democracies. Quoting Kazmude, they, the people, want to be represented without actually participating. So maybe we can do these two first and then we can go to some uh, oral questions and then. We should know. Let's put all the questions together okay, and okay. give them the panelists the final okay. word otherwise. Yes. Okay. So then we have from uh, Lassiri Abdullah. Um, he says a question. According to Al Tuzer, to what extent oppressive states have succeeded in fighting the pandemic compared to states where freedom is almost absolute? And then um, Gabrielle asks, uh, what? Uh, this is specifically for Professor Binati. What are the resources imminent to proceduralist democracy to contain its deformations or populism? For instance, it is increasingly popular to have a review of due process of lawmaking. Does this also cross the line into an epistemic conception of democracy as often, is taken, as often it is taken on the basis of parliamentary independent human rights or scientific procedural standards? And uh, last two, uh, to Professor uh, Calhoun uh, from Aubrey, with the view of populism that you have given, how possible would it be to stop this populism from escalating into the once experienced German Volksgemeinschaft, the national community, the national community, and all its consequences that we, and all the consequences we already know? So those are all the written questions. Unless, let's, how many people have raised their hands to speak? How many uh, questions? Well, we have uh, David Ercito, one of our students, uh, Del Munim and Albana have uh, asked. So let's go through it and then we'll give the, four, the final panelists. Okay. Then the, so the David, go ahead. Okay, hello. Hello everyone, thank you for the nice conversation. I actually wanted to make one question to Professor Urbinati. Um, that gave me nice lectures as well on uh, on populism. So we we had talked a lot about these things. Um, you mentioned before that uh, it was. I mean, what you mentioned before was very interesting regarding the advent of science in an era where ignorance nowadays cannot be allowed, especially since it provokes death and I mean it provokes the spreading of the virus. Um, the main issue that I see with these things is that science is not a united community, as you said before. Uh, but this thing can be exploited by populism, and I think that populists have done so in the past by demonizing science in this sort of neo-romanticist um, conception of life where, where emotions have to come up first than science. And they, I, I think that they can capitalize on science, equating it to technocracy, and therefore twist the argument around about uh, who really endangers democracy. So I, would, uh, I just wanted to ask you, directly, um, how would you respond to this? And uh, I mean, how would this be uh, accounted for? Thank you very much. And I- uh, Thank you, just... Sophia. Who is next? next? Abdel Munim. Okay. Go ahead. I think you can speak now. Hello? Abdel. Uh, maybe we can uh, go to- um, Okay, let's, let's go to the next. Albana. Uh, unmuting, yeah. Uh, but very glad that um, Sheila so insistently raised the question about the political economy of, uh, behind populism, because this is a more generally the question about the conditions of possibility, right? Not just the normative or institutional parameters. Uh, well, I want to. I've, I've suggested that uh, it is a certain transition. Uh, beyond the neoliberal uh, free market logic and around the turn of the century 
um, the, the dominant logic of uh, policy making was to ensure the national competitiveness in the global economy. So first we globalize capitalism and then we start handpicking specific companies, uh, national champions to ensure the national competitiveness. So that switch from glo intensified global competition to national kind of a national um, uh, state sponsored um, uh, engineering of, of the economy uh, is uh, that uh, engine of the massive precarization because you, while you are prioritizing, while um, you are supporting specific companies, then the pressure on everybody else intensifies. So in my reading, this is this massive precarization of society in that sense of increasing the competitive pressures on all, then, then certain groups who, who, who sit at the very bottom of that stratification of precarity uh, be, uh, see everybody else as the enemy. This is the like the short the short story of that political economy of precarity. Uh, Sophia, is this all, or do we have somebody else? Well, Abdel Munim is now available. Okay, so please. So allowed to talk. Okay, Abdel Munim. The floor is yours. Abdel Munim. Hello? Okay, I think that we have to leave it at that. Let's give three minutes to each of the panelists to address whichever questions have been raised, those which have been raised to their presentations, or simply address whichever points you think are relevant. So please, Nadia, I know that you wanted to, so you start Nadia and yeah, we'll go in the same order we, we started. Thank you so much. Those are so many questions, but I'd like to focus on one that connects to several or three at least. The, um, the question of technology, science and non-participation, but in fact following more than being actively participants. So I think in my view at least, but uh, this allows me also to say something about what, what is, uh, oh, yeah, you left, you left. oh, Abishai said. Yes, it's true that we should connect populism to the transformation of democratic societies, not societies, systems and, and institutions, not society. Meaning what we have uh, uh, now is a populistic reaction to a situation that is completely changed in relation to how democracy was. It is based on organized parties or organized masses in which uh, interests were connected and organized, in which leaders were not left alone, but based on a organized and collective sense of the party. Now this, in the democracy of the public, to use a Bernard Manet effective uh, way of saying, it is a disaggregation of uh, people because of precarization. They, 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 even the unions are, these are in disarray. So in this case, it is an easy ground, an easy tumor used uh, for, for the formation of uh, leadership as uh, the dukes, uh, as the leader in this sense. So does it is true that populism has to do with the transformation of representation from a party's representation to embodiment into, into a leader. And this doesn't mean that it's, more, it's a more a call for participation. I don't believe that it's a fact the call for this participation. It's a call for somebody who, can, who is like us, like us, so they speak in a very buffoon like, like everybody can do. They don't have any kind of specialization or competence. They're like us, this as if we were like us. It's very important. This, definition of representation and this is a way of saying no participation but following it and thus uh, i think there are several uh, articles coming up now on very interesting on technology or technocratic uh, solutions and populism because they are somehow not so antithetical the technocracy and the and the and the, and the populist because populism is a quest for objective not partisan not pluripartisan uh, organization of the of the polity and that they would prefer to have a people a leader who can fix things do things uh, in the way uh, in which is more capable of doing using its own competences so it's, it's, it's not a call for more participation it's a call for homogeneous kind of masses 
without internal pluralization of ideology or interest. They, it, is an, it is an attack against partisan pluralism and pluriparties. They detest the parties and the populists because it's a way of fragmenting the people and thus making the few an easy game to gain uh, uh, victory. So they want to unify the masses to have a leader spoke, speaking for them and doing for them. They don't want to do things, doing for them and to eliminate, as Grillo, Beppe Grillo used to say, to eliminate uh, um, the partisanship from politics and go back to data, go back to uh, facticity and uh, objectivity. So we are one people with the good uh, leaders doing all the stuff and the job for us. I think this is an important issue that we undermine uh, sometimes when we represent populism as simply a reaction in the name of the good people against the bad people. We should understand how these reactions operate in a society in which parties are in desire, representative democracy is uh, in the object, is a object of contestation. So this is a redefinition of representation in a domain of uh, uh, of uh, mm, uh, media uh, uh, that is the public instead of uh, the citizens. It's the public, the real judge, the real big eye that uh, operates uh, in this domain. So this is my answer, perhaps messy one, but I'm sorry. There are too many things to be said. Okay, thank Nadia. Thanks, Craig. Uh, your last three, four minutes for your final comments to whichever the issues you want to address. Okay, I'll do the, the best I can. Um, first, I think it's less helpful to ask what is wrong with populism than to ask what is wrong with specific populist leaders or interventions or styles. Um, to essentialize populism and to imagine that it is an ideology and then wrong is to sort of miss, that's why I like Nadia's image of the game, it's a, a mode of playing a political game which can be captured or led by various uh, different leaders. And it's important, I think, that, that we attack leaders and bad actions, not followers. Um, we risk replicating the very failure of inclusion um, of the uh, populist movements by excluding people who are um, are mobilized in this way, who don't have to be mobilized in this way. They were available to be mobilized in other ways and weren't. Um, and we also, um, we elites sometimes, um, also rebel against them because they are undignified. Part of what, you know, the populace just are undignified. And I, I experience this too. I mean, it makes my skin crawl, um, but that's not a true political objection. Um, similarly, racism is real. It's, it's, you know, central, but it's not the whole story. If you look at UK Brexit, you have to look at geographic divisions. I mean, all of the net economic growth of the UK in the last 40 years was in London, Manchester, um, and their environs, essentially. Um, the rest of the country, not. Um, the Gilets jaunes express you know, the tension between a metropolitan France and a non-metropolitan France. So there, you know, there may be all these problems. I don't see them as the hope for the future, but I think you have to look at the sociological um, underpinnings of what, what comes. Um, even with the question of, of immigrants and all, you know, yes, there is this element of looking at them as alien and betrayers, but also as competitors. Um, and that's why the hostility, which is often expressed in terms of, oh, they're getting welfare benefits, is really things like they're getting places at universities that we thought our kids would get. Um, they are um, succeeding, and the hostility is as much to the successful immigrants as the non. Um, it's not just a question of the bad old elites or beating up ourselves. It's a question of looking at the institutional crisis, which, as Albina puts it, creates the conditions of possibility for populism. Um, I agree very much about the centrality of precarity, but I think also the parties in most of the advanced democracies were essentially broken. And the party system was broken by the time these populist movements started. They were giving it, you know, um, death knell, but it was already largely broken. 
Um, with regard to the question about solidarity, what does it mean? Uh, it's a long, I can't be long-winded, but I would say it means being in a collecting fate and knowing it. Social cohesion, but also not, it, it requires not just the idea, oh, I express solidarity, but we are really interconnected in basic ways. Um, and here again, precarity, privatization of risk is a problem with that. People are not, they, uh, they are in very different life circumstances where policies affect them very differently. Um, to the question that invoked Cas uh, Muda, yes, populism is an episodic engagement, not a consistent participatory structure, and it risks being publicitary. Um, I think Avishai is right to bring in the media. I will just say quickly, this is the most truly modern um, element of populism. But what we have to see is that it's also a partial substitute for organization. Populists have the combination of media and demagogues as a substitute for having meaningful organizational structures. The most important version of that in the modern world is the labor movement the decline of the labor movement, the absence of organizational structures, but also other kinds of organizational structures is basic to this conditions of possibility. Um, finally, to the, the question of um, national socialism and all that, I think a short answer, and it, it demands more, is social democracy was an available opportunity. It was an available opportunity that was resisted by liberals and betrayed by communists. And so it's not just that populism grew into the Nazi movement and other um, completely negative forms, it's that the ability to build other kinds of institutional structures was actively undermined um, uh, and um, therefore the institutions were not strengthened and therefore we got what we got. Uh, thank you, Craig, for your attempt to almost address every question. Abisai, your last three minutes, please. Well, I mean, Craig already addressed all the questions. <laughs> well, I think that there is, there is a genuine need for analyzing the global phenomenon of uh, populism. It's true that for political activists, to try to counter populism, you have to address the specific form in your body politics. And therefore you should address, let's say, for me in Israel, the form in which it takes. And, and someone in, in Turkey, Turkey populism or Hungarian populism. But it is, I believe, of out, of real importance to see what all populists have in common. For example, the, in many cases, in many, in many countries, it's the corruption of the leaders. Usually they are under threat, of, they are brought to court, Netanyahu just two days ago, and Trump and Erdogan, Usually it's what Sheila said, the family are always engaged in some kind of corruption or Modi in, in India. And therefore you start attacking the judiciary system. So part of the populism is what part of the conspiracy of the elite is trying to rule through the judiciary system. So the courts, so the constitution. So I think that once you see that there is a pattern here in many places, different form, then I think you are more equipped to deal with the specific form in which it takes in your country and see what is specific and what is common and what is the right strategy in case you that. And I agree with Craig, Populism is a disposition, not an articulated ideology. It's a, an attitude more than an opinion. But there is something common there in, in all its various forms. And uh, I think that the, the question about solidarity here is important. Solidarity, like 
There are many terms in political thinking which suffer from actually from pregnant ambiguity. Individual, take individual, it can be the narrowest term, the thinnest of terms that our society consists of individuals and individual to become a full-fledged individual is an achievement of the highest degree and to which we aspire. So when we talk about the solidarity needed for current democratic states is mutual responsibility as citizens. And it's a minimal idea. It's not the, it's not, there are forms of solidarity that demands far more. But the problem about the exclusion is to, to basically count on the idea that only the true people can share and have solidarity of the right kind. And therefore I'm advocating the solidarity needed for citizenship and not any, shall I say, thick idea of solidarity. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Please um, see. Uh, I want to go back to something that Nadia said, a couple of things that, which are very important. One of the consequences of the current crisis is uh, mass unemployment. We're talking about in the US 20 to 25%. These are unbelievable, inconceivable numbers. And it is quite likely that at the end of this, if there is an end, that we're going to be facing radically transformed workplaces, radically transformed balance between the private and the public, our own ban. It's not clear to me how higher education is going to come back. We may all be teaching like this for months and months. It's not bad. I mean, I'm not against this medium. I enjoy seeing everybody. But our universities are all going to be to be radically, radically transformed. So whatever this new normal is, I don't know if it will ever be, be normal. So in this context, plus the disarticulation of the party structures, the collapse of the party structures that Craig also mentioned, uh, there are going to be different kinds of movements that are arising. And I don't know if we will call them uh, populist or not, uh, one thing that has become very clear to me, watching the Trump administration deal with this crisis, is how, I mean, I'm sorry if I'm sounding again, it's just like the, my, my Marxist conscience has been awakened, how incredibly class and race and ethnic specific the burden of this crisis has been. When you look at the numbers in the United States of the death among the black and Hispanic people compared to the white elites and so on, I mean, I, I, I can't begin to think about, about New York, you know, it's just what's happened in the country. There has been such a sort of pulling apart of the curtain um, also on the Trump administration, I'll be, this is my last word. This was an administration that spoke a populist language, a language of ressentiment, mobilization against the, against the meritocratic elites. But it is an administration that is just like fundamentally betrayed and will be the American people unless the Democrats can push through all these all these economic economic uh, measures because there is a serious way in which and this is another conversation on I'll, I'll listen to what Craig is saying I fear a great unraveling of the social fabric in the in the United States and whether this will be mobilized in a way that 
support by a social justice movement, by an economic reconstruction, and a green new deal, uh, you know, we, we really, we really need, uh, need that. And whether it will be populism or something else, I would much rather, well, I'm just going to stop there. It's, uh, it's another conversation, but I did want to bring in the sense of, you know, social panic that I have about what's going on right now in the United States. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you all. Uh, we could go on and on because obviously those are very, very serious issues, but we have to stop. I wanted to stop at 12.30. We're already a few minutes beyond. Um, thank you to the four panelists. Thank you to all discussions. We had a, a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. And